Hi guys, good evening. I am Elon Bobar, Professor of Zoology. And today let us continue the topic what we had so far discussed about the invertebrate groups, the different phyla. And in this chapter, just I would like to go through the common things let you know. So, we would like to discuss some of the common aspects of uh, different kinds of phyla, the different groups of organisms coming under the category invertebrate. So, under this one, I would like to start something about the locomotory organelles and the nature of locomotion in the case of uh, protozoans. It's a common topic only, we are talking about all the phyla together. In the first one we begin, we begin with, that is a locomotion protozoa. So, the protozoans are taken into consideration for the locomotory activity because they have different types of locomotory structures. The locomotory structures are used for different types of locomotions. So, what are the different locomotory structures that the animals have according to the concept of protozoans? One, we have pseudopodia. So, in the case of class Rhizopoda, or we can say what is called actually Sarcodina. One class actually in the case of protozoans, a classification is made based on the nature of the locomotory structures. For example, we have class Rhizopoda having pseudopodia, having flagellata, the group flagellata having the flagella, group ciliata having cilia, and only one class of protozoans, normally they do not have the locomotory structures, namely the class Sporozoa. So, this is the only class which doesn't have the locomotory structures. For example, the Plasmodium, the Monocystis. So, these are all the Sporozoans, the Nosema, the one which causes some, site, some kind of disease in the case of either honeybee or in the case of uh, that is silk moth. So, this class includes animals not having any locomotive structures. Say, an example, Plasmodium or Monocystis or Nosema, these are all the parasitic protozoans. So, the parasitic protozoans coming under the class Sporozoa doesn't have any locomotive structures. Now, the Pseudopodia, that is a type of movement shown by the organism, is called amoeboid movement. The Pseudopodia concerned with amoeboid movement. And for example, in amoeba, or in the case of entamoeba, or in other cases. Then cilia and flagella. So cilia when compared to flagella very short and flagella very long. We will discuss the differences between these two later. And these two organelles are used for swimming. Hello, good evening. Just let us continue. So how in swimming movement? All are used for swimming movement, cilia and flagella. You see in the case of paramecium, the sleeper animal cube, we have cilia. So in the case of paramecium, we have cilia. In the case of euglena, we have flagella. Cilia, in the case of paramecium, euglena, they have actually, these animals have flagella for their locomotion. Then in the case of this euglena, or in the case of some parasitic animals, we have myonines. Some contracted filaments are formed. In the cytoplasm, for example, if you are taking euglena, so we have some filaments are running across the animal cytoplasm, and these elements are called the myonins. These elements are called myonins. These are all contracted elements formed in the case of euglena and some parasitic protozoans, and they are concerned with the gliding movement. So we have pseudopodia for amoeboid movement, cilia and flagella to the help in swimming movement. And paramecium just we have in the case of that one. And myonins, the contracted filaments, found scattered in the cytoplasm, for example, in the case of euglena, and also in some parasitic protozoans, they exhibit gliding mode or sliding mode. We'll proceed. Now, normally these structures are used for locomotion. When some of these locomotory structures, for example, pseudopodia of amoeba, and the cilia of paramecium, commonly called the animal cule, the sleeper animal cule. So, in these two cases, in addition to the locomotory function, they are also used for intake of food. Intake of food, that is the ingestion of food materials. So, even in the case of, for example, WBC, the blood cells, they are capable of actually ingesting the food. That type of intake of food or any solid or liquid food is called endocytosis. 
endocytosis. They are used for endocytes. That is nothing but the import of materials into the body. Import of materials into the body or intake of materials in the body. If actually the liquid food is taken, then it is called pinocytosis. Pinocytosis. Intake of liquid food. Otherwise called as a cell drinking process. And if the solid food is being taken inside, then it's called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis. Taking enough solid food materials by the cell by putting forth in what is called pseudopodia, then it's called phagocytosis. And pinocytosis is nothing but cell drinking process, and this is cell eating process. Solid and then liquid food. In both cases, now the pseudopodia are used for actually dragging in the food particles inside by means of endocytosis. So, anyway, pseudopodia and cilia are meant not only for locomotion but also for taking enough food materials. That's an ingestion process. But the flagella, they are concerned only with the locomotion, not used for capturing the prey or capturing the food particles. They are meant for only locomotion. Now, let us see some of the related questions of pseudopodia. So now with the pseudopodia, it's a temporary feat, you know that one formed at times of locomotion only, not being formed at all times. Now based on the number of pseudopodia, we can say it is either polypodial or monopodial. So in the case of amoeba, if you see the animal produces many pseudopodia, many pseudopodia, and such a condition is called polypodial condition. This is based on the number. And in some cases, we have only one pseudopodium, that is what is called in the case of entamoeba, the parasitic protozoan, that is the one which causes amoebic dysentery in our body. So in the case of entamoeba, a parasitic protozoan living in our lower intestine, or just actually that is eating on mucus layer of the intestinal wall, where you have monopodium. So this is one of the questions actually. How many number of pseudopodia found in entamoeba? The person came in the first paper and then there is the examination. There is how many pseudopodia or pseudopodium in the case of entamoeba? Only one. And how can you differentiate amoeba from entamoeba? That is amoeba normally has many pseudopodia and entamoeba has only one pseudopodia. And also, I mentioned earlier regarding the contractile vacuums. So normally the contractile vacuums are absent in the, in the case of parasitic protozoans. If you want to compare amoeba and entamoeba. So in the case of amoeba, we have many contractile vacuums concerned with osmo regulation. But in the case of entamoeba, no contractile vacuums. I mentioned earlier in the previous classes, in the case of parasitic protozoans, as they are living in isotonic solution, just like marine water or the body of uh, actually the host, Normally, just they do not have any contractile value. This is also another difference between amoeba and entamoeba. But based on the pseudopodia, there are many pseudopodia, here only one pseudopodia. Now, so it may be actually many or just one. In some cases, it is in the form of a lobe, then it is called lobopodia. Lobopodia. For example, the case of amoeba it is just like a lobe. If you are taking amoeba, you see that one is like a lobe, then it's called lobopodia. Then in the case of some animals, for example, some animal cubes, commonly called as actually the heliozoans and radiolarians. So in the case of these animals, I am taking this heliozoans and radiolarians, and from the surface of the body, many needle-like structures arise. And they represent the pseudopodia. Such a needle-like pseudopodia actually originating from the central body giving the appearance of the sun, hence the animal is also called a sun animal cube, action of fairies or animal, commonly known as sun animal cube. That's why the animals are called radiolarians because we have the pseudopodia radiating from the central body as like the rays of the sun. And such a needle-like pseudopodia formed in the case of uh, that is radiolarians and uh, Heliozoans, normally called as actinopodia or axopodia. Actino or axopodia. The needle like pseudopodia formed in the case of heliozoans or in the case of radiolarians. Now, various theories have been proposed to explain the mechanism of uh, that is uh, 
and we call it movement. But we have to know only the names of the persons and which is the most accepted theory and in our syllabus in Ender's point of view, we don't have actually the mechanism. Only you have to know the names of the theories, the persons concerned. Now various theories have been proposed out of these theories, we are taking into consideration four theories. Theory number one, surface tension theory. So it is actually the surface tension of the fluid of the protoplasm responsible for causing the formation of pseudopodia that help in locomotion. And this concept was proposed by Berthold. So I'm not worried about actual mechanism, we need only the concept only. That is Berthold proposed surface tension theory and that is the mechanism lying during the formation of pseudopodium and which help in amoeboid movement. Now the second theory, rolling theory. Rolling theory as proposed by genetics. So here there is a rolling of the various proteins formed actually in the cytoplasm or the pseudopodium, the rolling of the body that resulted in the formation of pseudopodium at one end, what we call this one, the advanced end. So the advanced end is nothing but the end which is proceeding first. So anyway, now the rolling theory as proposed by genetics. Then contraction theory or walking moment theory. Here also, as in our case, in our muscle, we have certain contracted proteins. And likewise, the proteins are undergoing contraction or even just the elements found in the cytoplasm or the protoplasm of the unicellular organisms like amoeba undergo contraction. And that is responsible for the formation of pseudopodia. And that is why it's called walking moment theory or contraction, just like here. And amongst other animals, the animal is walking just by using pseudopodia. Not like that of uh, actually the movement shown by higher animals, but simply we can compare. So, contraction theory as proposed by Dillinger. But the most accepted theory of uh, that is amoeboid movement was presented first by Hyman. He was the first person to propose a concept of that is what is called soldier theory or change of viscosity theory. So that is the most accepted theory. Later it was supported by two more persons, Panty and Mast. So out of the four theories, the most accepted theory is the solid theory or change of viscosity theory. So you know that one, the cytoplasm exists in two states. Suppose for example, if you take amoeba, so we have two layers of cytoplasm. We have two layers of cytoplasm. The outer one is called ectoplasm. Outer one is called ectoplasm. The inner one is called endoplasm. The ectoplasm normally formed in gel state, more semi-solid state. <coughs> the endoplasm always exists in solid state. That is what is called more fluid state. And both the states are interchangeable. The viscosity of the ectoplasm and endoplasm changes to the so that what will happen, the salt can be converted into gel or a gel can be converted into salt. So during composition process because of the loss of water we have formed the gel and then what will happen the gel when we add water it gets converted to salt. So formation of gel is called gelation process and formation of salt is called solution process. That is the main event, that is the change in viscosity of the fluid is taking place either gel state or salt state being formed according to that is the moment of the organism. So we are not going deep into this mechanism but we have change of viscosity salt to gel and gel to salt that resulted in the formation of pseudopodium. Now what is the first indication of the pseudopodium? So the first indication of formation of pseudopodium at the advancing and suppose this is the direction to which the animal moves. Here we have the ectoplasm. The ectoplasm contains what is called a hyaline layer. The hyaline layer at the tip of the pseudopodium forms a cup shaped structure. Now, this is the cup. The ectoplasm forms a cup shaped structure, and this cup is called hyaline cup or also called hyaline cap. Hyaline cup or hyaline cap. So, this is the first small scheme. What is the first indication of formation of pseudopodium when the animal starts moving? So the first indication of actually the formation of pseudopodium when the animal wants to move is the formation of hyaline cap, the layer of the ectoplasm. Hyaline layer is nothing but the layer of ectoplasm, it forms a cap-like structure. So in which normally the fluid moves then convert, convert to gel like that. So gel to source of gel is happening during that actually the moment. 
So anyway, the most accepted theory, that is what we have the soldier theory or change of viscosity theory as proposed by Hyman, supported by Mass and Panty. And the first indication of pseudopodium is nothing at the formation of hyaline cap by the hyaline layer of ectoplasm, the one which is found in gel state. So we will not just actually go farther and just we need one the little bit, the interactive part. So these are all the different theories and during which what will happen I have mentioned just now. So the first stage in the formation of pseudopodium, what I represented already is the formation of hyaline cap. Where are that was seen? By the highly layer of ectoplasm, highly layer, somewhat just a thick fluid layer, and that layer later forms a cap like structure, and that into which now the projection of the protoplasm occurs, leading to the formation of pseudopodium. It's a temporary structure, you know that one. Now let's take now the pseudopodia are concerned with the amoeboid moment, and let's go to the next two structures, cilia and flagella. So at this junction, I would like to just compare cilia and flagella. First of all, I would like to compare this flagella of prokaryotes with the W carriers. So normally, there are two major differences between the flagella of eukaryotes and also the flagella of prokaryotes. So if you are taking actually cilia or flagella, even the centriote, we will come this later, centriote, then we have the blepharoblast or the basal body or basal granule, anything else. In all cases, if you make a cross section, you can have what is called 2 plus 9 arrangement or 9 plus 2 arrangement. For example, if you make a cross section of cilia or flagella of eukaryotes, you have actually the peripheral region having 9 fibers. 9 fibers. And in the center, we have 2 fibers. This arrangement is called 9 plus 2 arrangement or 2 plus 9 arrangement. So, that is the needs of the flagella or cilia or centriole or even kinetosome and to the basal body, basal granule, even the axial filament of the sperm. In all cases, if you make a cross section, just to be, just to be half, normally. So, we have actually, that is this 9 plus arrangement system, 9 peripheral fibers and then 2 central fibers. But in the case of prokaryotes, we don't have this 9 plus 2 arrangement. It is formed of only just only single strand. There is no 9 plus 2 arrangement in the case of prokaryotic flagella. We have only single strand. And second difference, in the case of prokaryotes, the flagella normally formed of a protein what is called flagellin. Flagellin. This is the nature of the protein in the case of flagella of prokaryotes. In contrast to this one, in the case of eukaryotes, the flagella are formed by protein what is called tubulin. Tubulin. So the flagella of prokaryotes are formed of flagellin, and then just to be how the flagella of eukaryotes formed of tube. This is a major difference. So between actually prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they are considering that is flagella structure and the nature of chemical chemicals found in them. So flagellin in the case of prokaryote flagella and tubulin in the case of prokaryotes or eukaryote flagella. So these are the two main differences. Now let's compare generally what are the differences between cilia and flagella. So normally you know that one cilia, some are shorter than flagella. Cilia normally shorter than flagella. And secondly, the movement produced by cilia faster. Cilia produce faster movement when compared with the flagella. And thirdly, normally cilia not only is for locomotion I mentioned earlier, but also used for engulfing the foot or capturing the foot. So used for foot capturing along with locomotion. But flagella concerned only with that is locomotion, not used for foot capture. Then what is the type of moment exhibited by cilia? The cilia exhibit what is called pendular movement pendular movement, just actually to and fro This is what we call this one, to and fro And whereas the flagella produces angular movement, so this is to and fro, this angular means wave-like movement, wave-like movement. So the flagella produce angular movement, whereas the cilia produce what is called the pendular movement. So to and fro movement by the cilia, and that is actually the wave-like movement exhibited or created by just a flagella. 
And I mentioned already, the cylindrical motion is always faster than flexible moment. Now, in the case of paramecium, so normally we have the cilia, we have the cilia, and if you are just taking the ciliary movement, actually, and the ciliary movement is regulated by a speculative structure. I mentioned earlier, and I will come to this later now, I mentioned earlier, if you are taking the structure of cilia, flagella, basal body, now another name for basal body is called blepharoblast. Another name for basal body is called blepharoblast, or it's also called what is called basal granule, or kinetous soap or even just actually so basal body, blepharoblast and kinder so more or less have the same meaning for example if you take the paramecium suppose you have the cilia the cilia is normally arising from a basal granule now this is what we call this one that is basal body or just actually blepharoblast or kinder so even basal granule so at the base of each cilia flagella we have a body which controls the movement of the cilia flagella and that one is called the basal body or basal granule, technically called blepharoblast, also another name for that one, kinetosome. We have the cilia flagella, the centriole, what we have in the case of animal cells, then the axial flagella of sperm. So all are similar in one aspect. This is also another question related to the intense point of view. So what I mentioned the structures here, all are resemble to each other. They exhibit one similarity. What is the similarity? They exhibit or show 2 plus 9 at each. So there is an array of 9 peripheral fibers plus 2 central fibers. This is a common characteristic for the structures what I mentioned. This is another question. Now in the case of paramecium, in the case of paramecium, we have actually structure. So, that is the first animal which has developed. That is the first animal which has developed. What is called neuromotor scent? Neuromotor scent. Neuromotor scent. Just like the brain, this is the first animal, paramecium has developed neuromotor scent. So, normally, actually, neuromotor scent, or we can say first one, just a Take this is neuromotor system. I am taking in this manner. There is a neuromotor system in the case of paramecium. This neuromotor system consists of two components one, motorium. This is another question, motorium. And this is otherwise called neuromotor center. Neuromotor center. The motorium is otherwise called neuromotor center. And uh, another component of the neuromotor system, infraciliary system. Infraciliary system. These two components together form what is called the neuromotor system. That is the first actually the controlling system comparable to the nervous system of higher animals developed in the case of paramecium. Now, if you are taking the infraciliary system, it once again forms up two components. A granule, what we call this one kinetosome. Kinetosome. This is one component. I will show the diagram just actually. I will draw the diagram later now. Now, many granules are present. From each granule, namely the kinetosome, there is uh, actually one cilium is arising. One serial is arising from each kind of soul. And now this is a granule controlling the movement of cilia. Now many kind of soul are interconnected by means of an interconnecting filament. The interconnecting filament is called kinetodesmator. Kinetodesmator. The interconnecting filaments are called kind of decimator, both together form the infraciliary system. And now, actually, the entire infraciliary system is connected to the motorium. Now, the one which is present near the site of pharynx of a paramecium, the site of pharynx, the gullet, through which one of the foot enters into the body of the animal, there you have the motorium. 
and this is the main controlling center, just like a bright of higher elements, coordinating the ciliary movement in the case of palpation. And all these things together cause a neuromotor system, the unix motorium infraciliary system, and that one comprises of kinetosome and kinetodesmator. So I will show it in the diagram. So if you are taking the palpation, So the animal has two nucleus, you know that one, have number of cilia all over the body. Number of cilia all over the body. So at the base of each cilium you have a gravel. I mentioned this. <coughs> so this granule is called kinetosome. What I mentioned earlier, kinetosome. So, the base of all cilia, we have this kind of soaps. like that. Now, this is what we call this one the cytopharynx through which the food enters. Now, the kinetosomes are interconnected like this. The kinetosomes are interconnected. So, the interconnecting filament is called kinetodesmator. Kinetodesmator. I mentioned earlier we have a center what is called a motorium. This is acting as a brine. So this is what we call this one motorium, the neuromotor center. So all the filaments are interconnected and finally connected to what is called the motorium. So it is the main controlling center giving instruction to the kinetosome and that one regulates the movement of the cell. And this system is called neuromotor system and found first in the case of the sleeper animal cule, namely just with the protozoa and paramecium. So this is also another person maturing, the neuromotor center is found in the case of a paramecium. Then, so these are some of the things related to the locomotion and further questions related to, that is reproduction of protozoa. So these animals, the way we are taking actually we are giving more importance for the protozoans because uh, of the examination point and also it is the longest chapter showing just the different kinds of actually the questions. Now one thing just about the locomotion, another thing I mentioned already just about the contracted vacuum. Now the third one about the reproduction. The animal reproduces both by asexual method and sexual method. The asexual method of reproduction is possible only at times of uh, what is called unfavorable situations. The sexual method of reproduction is possible during favorable situations. But normally, and the asexual reproduction, though I am using the word actually unfavorable and favorable, but in most protozoans, the asexual reproduction is more common during just actually favorable conditions. Now, the most important method of asexual reproduction is binary fish. Here one amoeba, for example, it gives rise to two daughter amoeba. And just we have also multiple fission at the time of unfavorable situations. Binary fission during favorable conditions. Multiple fission normally happens when the animal forms cyst. There is a condition what is called end cyst, inside which normally the nucleus device multiplies to form many daughter nuclei and each one is surrounded by a particular just actually a segment of a plasma membrane later discharged by the splitting of or by the rupture of the cyst wall. So binary fission is the most common method where you have two daughter cells are formed during favorable conditions. The multiple fission is normally possible during unfavorable, unfavorable conditions but this is a method of reproduction you know that one in the case of plasmodium. So in our body when present animal reproduces by multiple fission that method is called cysogony. The process of multiple fission in plasmodium is called cysogony. The cysogony method. So multiple fission normally found occur in certain organisms. The sporulation is also a type. So it forms a spore during unfavorable conditions. And just the animal forms a spore. The cytoplasm is covered by a thick wall and it is actually a resting stage. So a resting state and during later conditions the amoeba multiplies by multiple fission producing a number of dot amoeba. And I mentioned we have a peculiar mechanism what we call this one plasmotome. This is another method of uh, reproduction seen in one animal or parasitic animal for example papillina. 
a parasitic animal of vertebrates and other animals are found in the rectum of frog. Now, the binary fission, a question came from this one, what is the nature of binary fission in the case of uh, that is different animals? So if you are taking the binary fission in the case of amoeba, it is irregular. And in the case of uh, iglina, suppose you are taking iglina, it is vertical. This question came in the question paper. What is the nature of division in the case of iglina? It is vertical. And if you are taking the paramecium, so the nature of uh, that is uh, binary fission is transverse or horizontal. So remember, amoeba irregular, Euglena vertical. In the case of paramecium, we have transverse division. So these are all, though we have the binary division, the plane of division is different in different groups of organisms. Now what is plasmodium? So there is one organism, what I mentioned earlier, a pellite. So the animal is multinucleate. So the animal is multinucleate having many nuclei. So what will happen? So at the time of division, the multinucleate mother cell divides into many multinucleate daughter cells. Many multinucleate daughter cells. So these are all the organisms. The daughter cells, I mentioned again there are four cells. So you see in all these four cells also actually we have many nuclei in each. So what is plasma tomy? The multicellular, sorry, the multinucleate actually the mother cell divides into many multinucleate daughter cells. And each daughter cell has many nuclei. So during the process what will happen? There is no nuclear division. Only the cytoplasm divides like this. Only cytokinesis and there is no division of nucleus. So if you have just a hundred nuclei, they are equally distributed in different cells which are formed at the end. That's why it's called plasma tomy. Tomy, cutting. So only the cutting of the cytoplasm, the division of the cytoplasm and there is no division of the nucleus. That is a peculiar method result in the case of actually a pelina, a parasitic protozoan and that is called plasma tomy. Now, sexual reproduction is possible the sexual reproduction just normally occurs in the case of paramecium. The sexual reproduction is by means of syngami. Syngami. That is nothing but fertilization. Now there are two different types of fertilization or sexual reproduction under the syngami. One is isogamous type. Another one anisogamous type. Isogamous, anisogamous. Or isogamy, anisogamous. For example, in the case of monocystis, one parasitic protozoan, the male and female gametes are similar in their external appearance and also physiological nature. And isogamy, for example, in the case of plasmodium, if you are taking actually the parasitic protozoan, now during the life cycle in the case of the insect vector, female anaphylis mosquito, there you could see there are two different types of gametes, the male and female gametes. The male gametes are called microgamete, the female gametes are called macrogamete and megagamete. So they are different in size, also in their activity. And that method, the unit of dissimilar gametes is called anisogamy, example plasmodium. Isogamous type, example monocystis, a parasitic protozoan, not formed in our body but in the body of vertebrates and that is a monocystis. There you have isogamous type of sexual reproduction. So another method of reproduction that is normally we cannot say that one sexual reproduction but we can just do this one and uh, sexual reproduction what is called conjugation. So conjugation is actually a method of pairing of individuals. They are exchanging their nuclei and after which what will happen, nuclear reorganization occurs. Ultimately, the mating pair of cells separate. So two cells are joining, the resultant product also only two cells. That is why the conjugation is not considered as a method of sexual reproduction, but union of two different strains occur. They are exchanging their nuclei for nuclear reorganization. And this conjugation normally occurs during normal unfavorable conditions but do not occur normally conjugation processes do not occur during favorable conditions. So I mentioned all it is meant for nuclear reorganization. So there is no conjugation process during favorable conditions. 
and that is about this is not a method of sexual reproduction again there is method of reproduction actually even some books it is given insist men condition it is also not a method of reproduction it is for overcoming the just what is called the unfavorable or tied over the unfavorable situations so there is about something related to the locomotion as well as reproduction because we are giving importance to that one so we are considering that one in terms of examination point of view now so let's go to some other questions one by one so there is one protozoan what is called trichomypha it's meant for even it is coming in an ecology for animal association it is a flagellate protozoan it is normally living inside the body of white ants namely the termites the white ants namely the termites so it is living in the intestine of white ants normally called as a termites now you know that when the white ants are feeding on wood, the cellulosic material, but they do not have the enzyme cellulase to digest the cellulose what they are eating, and for that they need a help. They need the help of somebody. The help is given by Trichomypha, a flagellate protozoan, found living in the intestine of that person. Now these two individuals are mutually beneficial. Symbiotic relationship is seen between these two. You know, symbiosis is kind of relationship in which both the partners are mutually benefited. Given take policy. Now the trichomypha gives actually or digests the cellulose and in that way it helps for white ants. Whereas the white ants provide accommodation, the lodging place for trichomypha as well as food. So both organisms are mutually benefited. So, these two are examples for symbiotic association, trichomypha aflagellate protozoa. Now, another one, proteosponge. So, in evolution we have, there are certain organisms having characteristics of uh, two different groups. That is why they are considered as a connecting link or integral forms or transitional forms. Connecting link or integral forms or transitional forms. Now for example, one mollusk what I mentioned you Plina, the one which lived only during the Cambrian period, the only mollusk that flourished during the Cambrian period, that is of Paleozoic era. So some of the animals act as connecting link between two different groups as they have the characteristics of two different groups. So one such animal is Proterospongia. Yeah? A colonial protozoan, though it has the name spongy, yeah, it is a colonial protozoan, not a unicellular one, a colonial protozoan. And it is presumed that this is animal which have given rise to, that is the animal, the porifference, maybe the sponges. That is why it is called as the connecting link. As it is having or possessing the characteristics of both sponges as well as protozoans. And another one you see that one is glina. It is also acting as a connecting link. As it has chloroplast, it exhibits what is called the plant characteristics. One of the plant characteristics possession of plastics. But it is an animal because of the presence of central, because of the presence of eye pigment acts as anti. So the animal is actually considered because of its pigment eye, actually the eye which contains a pigment that is of similar to, that is similar to, that is a pigment found in animals. So Eglina, also known for you know the mixotrophic nutrition, we have studied. It exhibits autotrophic, it exhibits actually sapro, saprotrophic, and also it exhibits what is called holozoic animal type of nutrition. It is known for mixotrophic nutrition. Now in the case of acellomics, so another next we will go to the next phylum. In the case of acellomics, the body cavity, you know that one, it is acellomic animal that is actually for flat flatworms. Now the body cavity is filled with a kind of tissue, a collection of tissue. That tissue is called mesenchyme or parenchyma. Mesenchyme or parenchyma. Then, when you are taking the round wall, so I mentioned earlier, if you make a cross section of any round wall, an example for serocylomic animal, it exhibits a tube within a tube system of organization. A tube within a, a tube within a tube system of organization. That means it has two spheres, one outer and another inner circle. The inner one represents the gut or the digestive tract, and the outer one represents the body wall. So, a tube within a tube system of organization is exhibited by the round wall. That is an example for a single animal. Now, in the case of flat wall, 
The one just what I represent earlier, planaria, having a remarkable, remarkable power of regeneration. So in the invertebrate group, we have the hydra, the planaria, the sponges, the starfishes, the exhibita, a high degree of what is called power of regeneration. Now, in the case of free swimming larval sticks, sorry, in the case of planaria, a flat bone, it's a free swimming, actually, sorry, it's a free living animal. Then we have a free swimming larval stage, the name of the larva, the larva. Now, one of the parasitic adaptations in the case of brown bones, so they are living in, inside our body, but they can tolerate the digestive enzymes released by your body. Our enzymes cannot digest the brown bone. What is the reason for that one? So, they have a counteracting mechanism. To neutralize the enzyme released by the human body, they release or secrete anti-enzyme. And that one prevents the digestion in host industry. So that one neutralizes, that one prevents the activity of the digestive enzymes of the body to digest the small, the soft animal. And so we have actually not only the major phyla, in some groups we have some minor phyla also there, a limited number of animals closely related to. So for example, Tinophora, I mentioned already, Tinophora, the Tino actually brachia, the animals are similar to the celebrates. Likewise, in the case of groundhog group and in the case of what we call this Ascalmentus group, there are certain animals what are called the wheel animal cues. They are looking like they are exhibiting a wheel like most wheel animal cues. They are included under minor phyla named Rotifera. And it exhibits also parthenogenesis under this Ascalmentus. So Rotifera are commonly known as animal cues and they are closely related to the Ascalmentus and place under one minor phyla called Rotifera. Animals are called Rotifers or animal cues, wheel animal cues. And now we have the disease, what we call the elephantiasis disease. We have the elephantiasis disease normally called phylariasis also. And actually, it is also called as a Bancroft disease. Because the name of the bone that causes the disease is called Ucheraria bancrafti. Ucheraria bancrafti. After the names of the two scientists, Ucherer and Bancroft. In honoring the bank, uh, in honoring Bancroft, now the disease name is given as Bancroft disease or elephantiasis after the name of the person who just discovered this one. And now in the case of Rodomar War State, actually we are getting uh, the Infective stage, what we can say for example in the case of plasmodium, the infective stage is that sporozoite. Likewise, in the case of brown bone, the infective stage is nothing but the embryonated egg. So the egg is released from the body, not as such, already the embryo is developed inside. So that egg is released from the body that is infective to other organisms, other animals or other even human beings and that is called embryonated egg. Now, we talked about leech already, coming under the analytic group. The leech normally feeds on blood. It is a blood eater. That mode of feeding is called sanguivorous mode of feeding, what I represented earlier. Then how this animal digests the blood? So it doesn't have any enzymes for digesting the blood. It is also needing the help of one bacteria. That bacterium is normally responsible for digesting the blood in the case of a leech. The name of the bacterium is Pseudomonas hiridinis because the name of a leech, scientific name, hiridinia. That is why the bacterium is called Pseudomonas hiridinis and that is helping the animal to digest the blood. And uh, someone asked the person also what do you mean by hemocyclic system? So now in the case of all analytics, we have a closed circulatory system in which the blood is flowing through. But in the case of leech, we have the silomic fluid and the blood are somehow interconnected. And such a system is called hemosilomic system. Hemosilomic system. It is very common in the case of orthopods. Open type of circulatory system is called hemosilomic system. And here we have, though the animal has closed circulatory system, there is a connection between the blood as well as the hemosilomic fluid and that is exhibited by one in the leech and that is why it is called hemosilomic system. That is the circulatory system name of leech. Now, under the just arthropods, even the question is also the last year question, year before last, last year just right to it, which is the connecting link between analytes and arthropods. There is one animal, Peripatus. It is an arthropod. 
but exhibiting the characteristics of amyloids and arthropods. That is why it is called a connecting link or transition form or integral form between amyloid and arthropod. And again, this animal is known for its discontinuous distribution. It is not being distributed just continuously. Here and there only we have these worms, actually worm-like animals, but jointed appendages having nephridia just like the annulates and found in Himalayas, Africa, etc. not continuously distributed throughout the world. Then, we are having some insects, useful insects, you know that one. And in the study of insects, the field is called entomology. The study of insects is called entomology. We are talking about different useful and harmful insects. Some of them are used as biological control methods and some of them are beneficial insects, some of them are harmful and some of them are acting as pests. And one insect which is normally called as a silver fish, though it is having a name a fish, it is not a true fish, a silvery body animal normally found in, uh, just normally found along with the books, the boxes which are kept for a long time without opening. In such cases you have a silvery, a triangular animal is there and that is normally a wingless insect. No wing is found in case of such insect wingless insect are also known for a pest and also known for its normal name what is called silver fish and that is the lepisma. Now we have different types of larval forms during the development of insects. So some of them are exhibiting hollow metaboly and some of them are exhibiting what is called hemimetaboly and parametaboly. So metaboly the word refers to metamorphosis. In some cases the metamorphosis is complete that is called polometaboly. In some cases, the metamorphosis is incomplete, that is called hemimetaboly. For example, if the animal produces nif, then it is called hemimetabolous type. And in some cases, parametabolous, parametabolous type, then you have incomplete metamorphosis and also taking place in a very progressive manner, very slowly. So, anyway, we have insects, we have different types of larva. So, let you know the different names of larva in different groups of insects. For example, in the case of ants, bees, wasps, even in the case of beetles also. Beetles, the pest of our plants. The larval form is called as a grapple. And in the case of larva, moths and butterflies. You know that very simple name, the caterpillar. And there is also one question. You see, moths and butterflies are related to one another. Likewise, dragonfly, dragonfly, and damselfly. These two are also related to one another. And likewise, the grasshopper is related to what? So there is a large one, locust. So grasshopper is related to locust. This is the normal grasshopper, and this is the largest locust. Actually, grasshopper. So, moths and butterflies related, dragonfly and damselflies related, then we have the grasshopper and locusts are related to each other. So, the larva of houseflies is called the maggots. Now, with their form, you know that one just in actually the decaying organic waste. And the larva of mosquitoes, now we call as regulars because they exhibit regular movement. And so, we have grub. Then caterpillar, maggots, regular. So in the case of crustaceans, we have so many types of larva. For example, zoea larva, nauplius larva, like that we have. So here we are talking about what are the insects. Then, number of diseases actually caused by the protozoan parasites to the useful insect. So one such parasite which affects epiculture, which affects epiculture is nosema. The protozoan, nosema causes nosema disease or nosemia disease. So the same nosema protozoan parasite causes a disease. In the case of silk moth, the name of the disease caused by nosema in silk moth is febrile. This is the disease. Nosema causes febrile disease in the case of silk moth and nosema disease in the case of that is um, honeybees. So it is a threat to Epiculture as well as what is called sericulture. So, if you compare the mosquitoes, we have different types of mosquitoes. How can you differentiate, for example, Culex mosquito from Anaphilus mosquito by its sitting posture? So, normally, Anaphilus mosquito is placed actually in an inclined position. 
whereas the killer's mosquito is placed there, normally parallel to the substrate. Now, we have different types of mosquito, Aedes mosquito, Culex mosquito, Anaphilus and also Culexin mosquito. Now, what is the difference between Aedes with Culex and Anaphilus with regard to laying of eggs? Now, Culex and Anaphilus mosquito, they lay eggs in water, whereas Aedes mosquito, the one responsible for causing the dingle fever and yellow fever, it always lays eggs in moist soil. Even just with small amount of water is enough for this animal to lay the eggs. But Culex and Anaphilus always they lay eggs only in water, so they need large amount of water. Now, in the case of one organism, one insect, which is normally called as a plant, lies causing damage to the plant, that is aphids. Now, in the case of aphids, that animal is known for its vivipari, so it gives birth and once. And also, it is known for parthenogenesis. It is also known for parthenogenesis. Though we have male and female animals are found in the colony, there is no sexual reproduction in the case of this animal. The female lays diploid egg. The diploid egg develops into either male sex or female sex, but there is no fertilization. So, that is why it is called as actually an example for complete parthenogenesis. Honeybee is example for incomplete parthenogenesis. Now, this one is known for complete parthenogenesis. And also the type of parthenogenesis called amphitoki. 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 A M P H I T O K Y. Amphitoki. So the development of a female or male from unfertilized diploid egg. That condition is called amphitoki. So we have, you know that the, we are the largest producer of lac, produced by the lacciva laca, that is a useful insect, one of the useful insects that produces the lac. And that lac institute is normally the research institute located in Bihar. So we are the largest producer of lac. And we have seen also the honeybee dance, the waggle dance, and the round dance produced by the honeybees. It was disappeared, disappeared by, uh, that is called one freeze. And that one is meant for communication. The main reason for honeybee dance is communication. So it exhibits two types of dance, and that dance actually shows the remaining animals where is the honey, whether it is in the north direction or the south direction, how long it is there. So that is for communication. The bee dance is for not any else. Actually, we have some animals that are exhibiting dance, you know, they don't attract the female, but here it is meant for communication, showing the direction of the honey, the distance of the honey, where is it located. So we have a vector, most of the insects are acting as a vector. So one such vector, actually most of the diseases is musca, the housefly. The housefly is considered as the most important vector for most of the diseases. Then, I mentioned already Neoplina and mollusk. And mollusk, recently discovered mollusk, a connecting link between what is called annelids and the mollusk. And also just exhibiting segmentation. And now this is the only mollusk that lived there, just flourished during the Cambrian period of Paleozoic era. As it is also considered as a living fossil. So originated during the Cambrian period, living till today, but without any modification. So the animal is not responding to evolution. So that is why it's called as a fossil, a living fossil. Then I didn't mention about this one Doris when I talked about mollusk. So it is commonly known as seed lemon because it is spherical in nature looking like actually a spherical lemon fruit that is why it is commonly known as seed lemon. Now the most advanced mollusks we have the cephalopods for example the octopus, the devilfish what we can see, cuttlefish, the sepia and also sea squid. And the eyes of cephalopods normally Comparable to the eye of vertebrates because some of their complicated structures. So out of all the mollusks, it is the most advanced mollusk, cephalopods. The primitive mollusk we have Ceranogastrus, another type of mollusk, the primitive one. Now this is the most advanced. And they have closed circulatory system. Normally in all the mollusks we have open, but here closed circulatory system. And these are all the animals having the eyes. And these eyes are exhibiting actually complexity, more or less similar to that of a, that is vertebrate eye. So the eye of cephalopod and the eye of vertebrate are considered as analogous organs. 
So, what do you mean by analogous organs? Organs which have similar in origin. Sorry, organs which have different in origin, but organs are performing the same function. For example, the eye of mollusk, eye of vertebrate, they have different origin. But both are concerned with one common function, namely just to fish. Even for example, another example, the wing of insect, the wing of bird, these were also considered as analogous organs, having different origin, but performing one common function, namely the flight. So I mentioned already the most evolved mollusks are cephalopods. So, you have in the case of one type of mollusk, the gastropods, the shell is spirally coiled, asymmetrically nature. The asymmetry of the gastropoda is because of a torsion, that is a twisting of the body during early embryonic development. And we have a number of economically important animals, and they are belonging to three different categories, three different phyla. One, the cylindrator, for example, the corals. Number two, we have that is arthropoda, there you have honeybees, then lac insect, and also silkworm. And in the case of the third one, Malaska, the pure oyster pink tiger. So these are the only three groups which are economically important to human beings. Now, in the case of the cephalopods, and actually, there the food is modified into arms. In the case of Actopus, we have 8 ohms. In the case of Sepia Patricus, we have 10 ohms. Now, inside the body, they have a cavity, what is called a mantle cavity. Now, what, what this animal actually does? The animal takes in water and stores the water in the mantle cavity. The mantle cavity communicates to the exterior by means of a siphon, a tube. When the animal wants to move, it just pushes the water outside with a great speed, just like the dead plane. And as a result, the animal is moving with its posterior end forward. This system is called what is known as the jet system of locomotion, seen one in the case of uh, actually cephalopods. They are not using any fuel but using only the water, and the water is sent up with a great force, so the animal is moving with its posterior end forward. Now, you have in the case of echinoderms, I mentioned already, you have a symmetry. The adult symmetry is by the adult symmetry is pentaradial or radial symmetry and the larval symmetry is normally violated. As the violated symmetry in the case of larvae gets converted into radial symmetry, that means the radial symmetry is developed only after violated symmetry. This is called secondarily developed symmetry. The first symmetry is the violated symmetry. The radial symmetry in the case of Adam is a secondarily adapted or developed for its mode of life. And now, so normally the last group, the echinoderms are closely related to the cardiacs. In what way? Mainly you know there are four similarities between echinoderms and the cardiacs. Now if you are comparing the coelom, in both the cases we have enterocelum. Both are enterocelum in animals. Then the second one, both are deuterostomes. The mouth is formed at a later stage of development in both the cases. Then both animals have mesodermal endoskeleton. Mesodermal endoskeleton. So enterocelum, deuterostomes, mesodermal endoskeleton. And finally, the nature of the cleavage, they are radial and determined. So these are all the four main sorry, similarities between the echinoderms and cardiacs. That's why these were all closely related animals. So here also, even the echinoderms are related to cardiac, but it's what is called similarity in what way the development of coelom, the nature of the coelom is enterocelum. Now, during the development of echinoderms, we have a larva, what is called biopinaria. This biopinaria is not only the larva for this echinoderms, it is considered as the ancestral larva for echinoderms. Then we have the neurocortex, hemicortex, and also cortex. It is actually the ancestral larva form for echinoderms, hemicortex and cortex. So, and these are all the just actually common things what we have talked about so far, just related to the various groups of invertebrata started from, these are common characteristics. Some of the important things also relate to the examination point of view, starting from the protozoans up to echinoderms. That's why I mentioned actually the echinoderms are closely related to the cortex. And that too, normally, it is related to one group of organisms called hemicordata. Though this group is called hemicordata, it is not a cordate group. It is considered as a non-cordate. 
because of the doubtful status of the motor car. So formerly it was included under the pro corrector and also corrector, but it is being now excluded from the corrector because its not a corner. The presence of not a car is a doubtful status in the case of this animal. And now this animal doesn't have any nota card, that's why it's put under separate phylum and non cardiac group. So with this I concluded, then we have to go through this one in the next class, something about the hemicordata and also the animals, in what way it is normally significant in terms of evolutionary power. So if you are interested, you are supposed to ask any question and post the questions there and then we are ready to answer. So thank you, till then the next week, so goodbye. So the class is complete.